Hello, and welcome back to the channel. I'm John Panicola. You're watching Dr. Hollowed. Today we're going to be playing a game called Ghost Song, and for our topic, we're going to be taking a look at the scariest real-life stories. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the video. One night back in 2011, I was home alone. I heard a noise outside our house, as if something metallic fell. I didn't give it much thought thinking it must have been the wind knocked off some light metal. Next the curtains. We placed some curtains over the door. A small breeze went inside the house and, naturally, the curtains rose but one of it was way higher than the other, as if someone walked in. My heart began beating so fast and goosebumps all over. I raised the TV's volume to distract myself. Then it happened. As I was having goosebumps, my back felt so hot yet so cold that a deep, audible voice called my name and so close to my ears. It was my deceased cousin's voice who died recently. I ran outside as fast as I could. It took me two seconds to get out running. Our neighbors were wondering what the hell happened since I looked spooked in bare feet. And to add more to its creepiness, on afternoon of the same day, around 2 p.m. to 3 p.m., our kitchen smelled like that of a burning candle though none of us lit one nor anyone within the perimeter. When I was about 11 my family moved to a new city. I had made a friend and went to a roller rink to her birthday party. Well no one ever showed up and I had no way home cause she said her parents were going to drive me home since it would go until 8 p.m. In winter it gets dark real fast too. So I had to walk home which was at least a two hour walk. I barely knew my way around. I walked through a sketchy area and noticed this guy following me in his car. I kept crossing the street whenever he would turn and I knew he'd end up driving the opposite direction. He caught on and ended up pulling up beside me and telling me to get in his car. I kept walking and he pulled up a bit and got out of his car and tried to grab me. Luckily a woman saw from her closed bakery and came out and scared him off. She took me in and I bawled my eyes out. Ended up a good night cause cops let me ride in the front seat and turn the siren on lol. Guy was never found but I still know what his ugly face looks like. A couple years ago, I was working downtown and had just ended the day around 5.30 pm. It was summer so still completely light out with plenty of people around. A bit of context, there had just been a fatal shooting of a young African-American man by a white police officer in the city. This shooting was uncalled for and many people were, rightfully, upset and tension was high. I was waiting at the bus stop, and a homeless middle-aged man came up to me and asked for money. I said that I didn't have any cash on me, and that I was sorry. He noticed a ring I was wearing on my right ring finger, and started going off about how I looked familiar and that he had seen me on TV. He then immediately claimed I was the officer's wife, and started saying some very prolific things to me. I politely said that no, that wasn't me, that I'm not married. He continued on, completely convinced I was this police officer's wife. Thankfully my bus had just arrived, so I hurriedly got on. The man followed me on the bus, guess he did have money after all, and sat a few seats away. He kept talking to himself about how all police are killers, that they all deserve to die. Normally my stop was only a few down the route, but I got off at the next stop ahead that was in a more populated commercial area. As soon as I got off, he ran after me and said how I deserved to die with my supposed husband and how he was going to shoot me to teach him a lesson. I sprinted across the street and into the nearby coffee shop. Thankfully the baristas could tell something was very wrong, and I told them about the man chasing me. I didn't get much out as I was crying and shaking, but they understood enough to know what was happening. He followed into the shop not long after, and the employees handled it well and threatened to call the cops. He stormed out of there still yelling and screaming about it all. The employees were so nice and accommodating, and waited with me while I called a lift to take me back home. My boyfriend immediately bought me an alarm that I keep on my keychain at all time. It could have gone so much worse, but it took me a while to be able to take the bus again. I was working at a Kinko's when I was college when a middle-aged lady came in for some copies and spent some time catching up with some of my co-workers and chatting with me about working there, going to school, etc. We were near the courthouse and all the law offices so we saw a lot of legal business, and we had previously been open 24 hours fun fact, Kinko's were frequently robbed because people knew they were open late so all graveyard employees had wearable panic buttons. Our shop was no longer open overnight, but always had a somebody running jobs. Well the lady who came in, it turns out, was the mother of a former employee, who had been kidnapped, raped, and brutally murdered by her overnight co-worker before her body was stuffed in a sleeping bag, dumped, doused in accelerant, and set on fire. This had happened only five or fewer years before, and a lot of my co-workers overlapped with the victim and perpetrator. 
The victim had been a college student, who was set to depart for the Navy in a couple weeks. Mom was back in town to appear for a parole hearing, and had even casually asked me if I knew her daughter when we were talking about her order, which was copies of letters, diary entries, pictures, and other personal stuff to present to the committee as part of the victim impact statement. Just a few weeks earlier myself, the overnight co-worker, and one of our assistant managers had a regular customer chase off a level 10 creeper who had been hanging around the lot for a few hours, and trying to get the grave person to let him in slash talk to him, before we open at 6 a.m. The police had dropped by a couple times but hadn't seen anyone but not five minutes after we unlocked the doors he was hanging around in the self-service area staring at us, and was so creepy, other customers noticed. I was going for a 5 kilometers run through the conservation area across the street from my parents' house, I was 16 at the time, and the entrance slash exit I used was a far less common one than the main one. When I'm walking the last 1.5 kilometers as a cool down, 30 degrees plus and high humidity, it was mid-July, I realized there is a woman with a pit bull on a chain, yes a chain, not a leash, following me. I start jogging again and she speeds up as well to follow me past the turn off to the main entrance. I don't know what but something told me in my gut to hide. So I speed up and turn a corner decently ahead of her. I go off the path and hide in the bushes behind a giant tree that's on top of a small hill, really it was more of a ditch behind the tree than anything. Her and her dog pass looking around like crazy as she can see I'm not on the path ahead of her. Sadly she stopped at the bridge over the river maybe 100 meters ahead, and I did not want to see how long she would wait for, it had been 5 minutes already and my fear instincts were through the roof. So when I see someone coming in the opposite direction and the woman isn't looking I sneak out and run as fast as I can pass this lady and turn down the path to get out. Her and the dog are following me, she is practically running herself. Again I get far enough in front that I can hide in the bushes before the last bridge marking my half km or so, I grew up walking these paths several times a week since I was 5 years old so I know every little spot, thank FSM. The woman continues over the bridge, where there is a fork in two directions, one a fast way out, less than 100 meters, but would spit me out 3 kilometers from home, and one the last half km to my exit. I see her go down the long way where I need to go, probably hoping she can find me on the path. I wait until she must be a decent way along before I venture out of my hiding spot and I run. I see her up ahead and I have maybe a quarter click left until I'm on the road and can see my parents' house, so I sprint like never before. I do my best to stay on the side of the path so she can't see me at first then I aim for as far from her as possible. As soon as I can see the road clearly I risk looking back. She had stopped walking and was just watching me. Then she turned around and walks back the way she came. There was no reason for her and her dog to go down that path then turn around, there are kilometers worth of trails that she could have stayed on. To this day I don't know why she followed me so intently and why she kept waiting for me. I haven't heard of anyone being attacked in the conservation area in the years following but I live on the other side of the country now. After that I never ran with music or without my cell phone even though I knew every trail like the back of my hand, even the unmarked ones made by deer. I once had a gun pointed at my face when I was 6. It looked like a handgun. The group of teenagers weren't too happy about us kids playing next to them when they were trying to do whatever the hell it was they were up to. They fired it somewhat in our direction, so that it looked like it was pointing to us but went down the road behind us instead to clear us off. For everyone else there, it worked. They hid behind a bush and started crying, whilst some went to alert my parents. I on the other hand, didn't understand what was going on and thought they were friendly, so walked right over to them. I remember my dad running over and yelling at me to get back, whilst being surrounded by about seven terrified children. I walked right up next to them and the kid holding the gun put it right to my face. One of the other kids recognized there was something off about me and took it away from them. They fled when my dad started running over, thinking I was about to be shot. My parents haven't talked about it since. I don't know what happened after that. I know that they wouldn't let me go further than two lampposts from our house for a good year and a half after that though. I was helping my mom by dropping her and my grandparents off for a doctor appointment at a nearby clinic. I was waiting in the parking lot as they got off and got in the clinic as a woman comes over to me and asks if she can get a ride. At first I was feeling generous and said sure where to? She was telling me she had to go to her daughter who was at school because she got hurt. I was about to ask what school as my mind blocked out her response and a tiny rational voice at the back of my head tells me hold up dude. Hold up. Go get your mom and ask her to bail you out on this. Don't think twice just do it. I tell her I would take her but I had to call my mom first to clarify what I was gonna do. I called her and told her, since we're Hispanics, in Spanish that there's a lady out here asking for a ride and to help get rid of her. She comes out and tells the woman hello. 
I'm sorry but he can't take you he has to pick up his sister from different school name again I'm sorry. I just nod and agree with my mom and drive off, my mom talks a little more with the woman but I see her going back in the clinic and the woman walks away. Apparently the woman asked inside the clinic for a ride. At least that's what she claimed. The clinic employees reported never even seeing the woman or her asking for a ride. And the school she was asking about was half an hour away from the clinic. Nowhere close to any schools nearby in town. She seemed very paranoid and in a hurry, but something about her made me cautious. Especially when she seemed calm and relaxed when I left the parking lot. I don't think there was a daughter. I had just moved to a new town and was renting a small one-bedroom apartment. The city I was staying in wasn't the highest quality city but it was close to where I worked so I didn't have much choice. Anyway, one night in the first month I was dead asleep as I had just finished a 24-hour shift at work. I think it was about 2 a.m. or so. I'm sleeping and I hear a blood-curdling scream from a woman. It wakes me bolt upright and lasts for about 3 seconds or so. I go from sound asleep to my heart pumping a thousand times a minute. This scream was the most terrifying scream I had ever heard. It sounded something straight out of a horror movie. I've never heard someone scream like that before. So I sit there in bed just listening. Waiting for a help or something. Nothing. No lights come on. No voices. Nothing. I call 911 anyway and tell them I heard an incredibly loud scream from a woman somewhere in my complex. I told them I know it isn't much to go off of but it sounded real and it sounded painful or afraid. I couldn't go back to sleep for over a couple hours with how jumpy I was. I never found out who it was or what happened to them. I had just moved to a new place and my girlfriend was staying the night with me. I had barely fallen asleep when she shakes me awake and whispers softly, there's somebody in the apartment. Half awake and still out of it, I ask her what she's talking about. She reiterates, there's somebody in here, they walk toward your kitchen. I try to talk her down, saying she just heard a neighbor making a noise, but she's convinced she saw a person peek around the hallway corner into my bedroom before going back out to the main living area. At this point, I'm absolutely frozen in fear and don't know what to do. We lay there in the dark for a few moments before she grabs a bat by my nightstand, turns on a light, and storms out of the room while shouting curse words at this potential intruder. Of course, no one was out there and my front door was locked. But we proceed to search every nook and cranny before going back to bed. We chalked it up to her having had a bad dream. Still, it took forever to fall back asleep. When I was seven my parents moved us into a slightly older house in the woods, built in the 60s or so. It was one story with a partly finished basement, and a really cool family room that had been an addition, so it was a couple steps down to it, and then the walls were large beams of wood and giant glass windows. Kind of a neat old thing. I'm pretty sure this house it when I started getting nightmares, but that can be partly blamed on my parents beginning to allow us to watch scary moves. Hid behind the vacuum while the babysitter watched Leprechaun. Would see a giant gaping hole in the wall, thanks to Poltergeist. That sort of thing. We had a beautiful brindle Akita at the time. He was an awesome dog. Great with kids, super protective, well trained and behaved. He didn't like strangers, but only until you introduced him and showed him they weren't a threat to the family. A very loving, affectionate guard dog. One day I was home with my mom, older brother, and younger sister. Dad traveled a lot for business and was out of town. All of a sudden, the dog stops at the top of the stairs to the basement, and starts barking and growling. This dog didn't bark. Not for people at the door. Not the mailman going by. He just didn't. My mom thought someone had broken in. Had to be. Why else would he be there barking? She scooped us all up, Put us in the car out front with my 10 or 11 year old brother in the driver's seat, told him if she wasn't back in 5 minutes to drive to the neighbors, and ventured back into the house and down into the basement with a kitchen knife, this was before cell phones, although we had a house phone, so I don't know why she wouldn't have just called the cops. She came back, and hadn't found a thing. No person, no signs of a break-in, nothing missing, everything was locked. Meanwhile, the dog was freaking out at the top of the stairs. It was a weird story told by my family for years. Much, much later, when I was in my 20s, my mom confessed that a previous homeowner had hung himself in the basement. My poor brother's room was in that basement. A wood-paneled windowless room. He never said anything scary happened down there, but that was when he started turning bad. He died this year from a drug overdose. I've been watching, a certain scary show on Netflix that I don't want to say for spoiler reasons, and it's reminding me of all this shit. I don't believe in ghosts, but, when I was 16 I got my first boyfriend, and as teenagers with cars we liked to drive around and make out in random places. 
One night we chose a neighborhood that was under constructions only a few foundations and half-finished frames, mostly dirt. We parked his car near a pile of dirt. This was a totally desolated area, no adjacent neighborhoods within a few miles, not a lot of trees, and those that were there were newly planted, excluded the foresty areas surrounding the outskirts, at least a few hundred yards away from us on either sides. No lights, just nothing. So, we did our thing and when we were done and trying to move the car, we realized it was stuck in the dirt. He got out to push and I was ready to put the car in reverse. Before we'd even gotten the chance to start, a man a man appeared out of nowhere in front of the car. Illuminated by the headlights, I remember him as being scruffy, poorly dressed, but nothing that screamed homeless. And, I remember the instantaneous drop in my stomach and the quickest glint of what was most definitely a knife in his hand. My boyfriend didn't have the same view, and was walking towards him, probably to explain that we were stuck. I screamed as loud as I could for him to get in the car, and for whatever reason, for the first time in his life, he listened and ran the few steps and jumped into the passenger seat. I floored it, and miraculously the car moved. I didn't pay any attention to the man, but he told me later that he had started running towards the car. He could easily have been someone paid to keep an eye on the place, there could have been a place to stay that we didn't see, but I had a horrible feeling in my gut and very much believe he was up to no good. I was driving my friends home from my house on St. Patrick's Day. It was around 10.30 pm. My friend's apartment was just off of an intersection with a flashing yellow light. From about 50 feet away, we noticed a figure standing in the middle of the intersection under the streetlights. We figured it was a police officer making sure no one was drunk driving. I slowed down as I prepared to turn and the closer we got, we started to realize it wasn't an officer but a man in a leather jacket and ripped jeans, staring us down and not moving as we approached him. I pulled into the turn lane and the man beeline for my car, coming up on my driver's side. His eyes were huge, wide open and bloodshot. He came up to my window and banged on my door, but he didn't say anything, no yelling for help or harassment, just locked eye contact as he hit my car door. I sped up and turned through the intersection as fast as I could. My friend looked back and saw he was running after us. We drove to the back of the apartment complex but it was a dead end. We turned off our headlights and my friend dialed 911. We all were dead silent and frantically looking around to make sure he hadn't found us. We told the police our location and his description. After about 30 minutes of terrified silence, I drove to the front of the building and dropped my friends off, making sure they got inside safe. I pulled out of the lot and back to the intersection so I could get onto the main road. He was still there standing in the middle of the intersection and began to chase me down again. This time I just sped off as fast as I could and stayed on the phone with my boyfriend until I was home safe. Just after I graduated college, I was living in a house with a friend in a shady part of Atlanta. I was actually moving out the next day because of some issues with the landlord. I had gone to bed that evening locking my door to my bedroom like I always had. Sometime during the middle of the night, I awakened because I heard my bedroom door close. I knew that was impossible because I locked it, so I went out to see what had happened. My roommate was asleep in the living room on the couch. I woke him up and asked him hey man were you just in my room? He was confused, and had no idea what I was talking about. I decided to go back to my room, and as I turned to walk down the hallway, straight ahead of me, on the other side of my room, my window was wide open. I backed up and told my roommate the window was open. He didn't believe me until he saw it. All of my stuff was in boxes, but I decided to go back into my room to get my phone to call the police. As I walked down the hallway, just passing the guest bathroom, a man jumped out of the bathroom and held a knife to my neck. If you fucking move I will kill you. Those words still ring in my head like they happened yesterday. He was a tall man, had to have been at least 6 apostrophe 3, wearing a red sweatshirt with a hood, dark skin, scruffy face, and smelling of tobacco. I froze. My roommate who is still in the living room, turned and ran out the front door soon as he saw it happen. Suddenly and without warning, the man pushed me to the side, ran straight for through my bedroom, and dove headfirst out the window. Just like that, it was over. I still had scrapes on my chin from where the knife had made contact with my face on its way to my neck. Of course the APD did nothing to investigate and I clearly moved the next day the hell out of that neighborhood. Reconstructing it, the man had come in through my window which had a broken lock, went into the living room, saw my roommate, and heard me coming. He hid in my bathroom, in my shower, waiting for an opportunity to make his escape. I no longer like shower curtains that aren't clear. I was working as a landscaper in Pennsylvania when I was about 16 and we were scheduled to work on a local doctor's yard one Monday, I think, morning. On our way to the job site, we stopped at a fast foot joint for some breakfast. While we were there, 
This lady I worked with got super uncomfortable because a really creepy guy, owner of a nearby Italian restaurant, was sitting in one of the booths, wearing a trench coat, staring at us with a total deadpan expression. She really wanted to get the heck out, so as soon as our food was ready, we bounced and went to the job site. On our way there, she explained that this guy had previously tried way too hard to ask her out before, but she always turned him down because he was creepy and married. Fast forward an hour or so, and we're at the job site a few hundred yards and hear some really loud bangs. We all ran to our truck because it sounded like someone had run into it, but there wasn't anything there. We were confused, but went back to work for 20 minutes or so, until a UPS driver sped up the driveway and told us to take cover because there was a shooter on the loose and a potential hostage situation at a nearby church. We all hid for a bit until news broke that the shooter had killed himself and the coast was clear, but we were all nervy and on edge for the rest of the day. Later, we found out that the perp was the creepy guy we had seen earlier that morning at the fast food joint, and shortly after we left, he had run out to the adjacent parking lot of the Social Security Administration office, murdered his wife, the shots we heard, who he knew was going there that day, and then holed up in the church before killing himself when the cops showed up. We had literally seen him planning the murder and he was staring at us because of the lady we worked with. After that, I never went back to work there again, as school was going on and my parents didn't want me working in that area of town anymore, but I was pretty freaking shaken up when we found out what happened and how close we were to the crime scene. Side note, the guy's Italian restaurant closed immediately, but stayed vacant for years while they were figuring out what to do with it. I had older relatives who lived in the country, at the edge of a small town. It was really dark at night, especially in summer. I live in the city and would freak because they never locked anything and never closed the blinds. I was obsessed with shutting everything and lectured them on it, but they never listened because nothing ever happened. I always had the feeling there was someone out there in the dark, but put it down to living in the city. Then one sunny day I was sitting in the back of some outbuildings with my dog, and he started growling in a big way. I looked up and there was the guy from the next place over hiding in the bushes and watching me. I walked away, into the house, and told my family this. Unbelievably to me, they blew it off, because they kinda sorta knew the guy, he was their neighbor. I went home the next day and I don't think that I ever spent another night with them. It's incredible to me how people can be so. So. Naive? Oblivious? They trusted him more than they trusted me. A few months ago I was up at my family's vacation place in Michigan. My mom mentioned to our neighbor, a retired engineer and businessman well into his 80s, that I'm planning on becoming a police officer, so he decided to invite me last minute to go trap shooting, I've only shot guns maybe 5 or 6 times in my entire life. The trap shooting went alright, I only hit 2 out of 25 of the little clay pigeons but it was fun, and on the way back my neighbor was driving us down a 45 mile per hour road that was crossed by a popular trail used by bicyclists and runners. There was a woman standing in the road just off the edge of the trail, who had headphones in and was staring at her phone, paying no attention to her surroundings. I could see her from when we were still pretty far off as it was a long straight road, and I kept expecting for either her to look up and move out of the road or for my neighbor to drift over to the other side of the road so as not to hit her. But the woman was completely oblivious to her surroundings and my neighbor kept going straight and at full speed until I pointed her out to him, at which point he finally moved so we wouldn't hit her. Apparently he hadn't even noticed her until I pointed her out, so she must have been in a blind spot for him or something. If I hadn't been in that car, neither my neighbor or the woman would have seen each other before it was too late to stop what would have almost certainly be a fatal collision. Myself and two other girlfriends went to a house party with a group of people we had just met. Looking back, it was incredibly stupid. It was way out in the middle of nowhere. We went swimming in his pool and as I was walking in the house afterward to change I bumped into a screen door that was just leaning up against the wall instead of being attached. Nobody was around so I thought I'd tell the guy who lives there once I've changed. I went into a back room to change. I was alone. All of a sudden, the guy who lives there came barging into the room, screaming at me about breaking his shit. He turned around and locked the door to the room. I immediately started screaming for my friends as he begins chasing me around. Next, I hear one of my friends hauling ass down the hall and she full on knocked that door in by running into it. She grabs me and we three run to the other friend's car to get the hell out. This guy came running out of the house behind us shooting his gun at us. She had to navigate out of there while we were all huddled down in the floorboards to keep from being shot. Since we were in the boondocks we got lost and it took a good hour before we ran across another car. They were able to get us out of there by giving us directions. I left my purse in my haste and I was terrified for the longest time that he would track us down with my ID nothing else ever happened though. When I was younger, early 20s, I owned an 86 Pontiac Fiero, and live in Canada. 
Now these vehicles are not particularly good in the winter, I was on the highway traveling slowly back home after picking up a friend from the airport in Calgary, in a whiteout. With visibility very low, and so much snow blowing across the highway that it was difficult to even know where the road was, and I came upon a semi-truck stopped in the lane I was driving in on the highway. Steered left, rear of the vehicle immediately slides, counter steer the sliding, rear of the vehicle and the rest of it swing into the left lane with the front of the vehicle narrowly missing the back of the semi, slid the entire length of the semi-truck, counter steered again to slide back into the right lane with the rear of the car barely missing the front of the semi and regaining control of the vehicle. I pulled into the shoulder immediately and stopped, police lights came on behind me, an officer driving behind me had seen it all, he came over to my vehicle to see me clutching my steering wheel with the most adrenaline I think I've ever had coursing through my veins in my life to ask if I was alright. Few minutes breather, made it the rest of the way home safe. When I was a kid, probably like 11 to 12, my parents brought me to a place that was literally called Jesus Camp. We would do activities and worship and all the standard day camp stuff like swimming, playing yard games and whatnot. The priest who was in charge of my age group was always around in some capacity. Swimming, playing the games with us, showing us the secret hidden spots to hide from our parents, generally a pretty cool guy. One night I even got to stay up really late and play checkers with him. He invited me because he thought I needed some one-on-one -on -one counseling about my faith, so we stayed up until 2 a.m. playing checkers and having deep conversations about life and God and things of that nature. At my age, I was just excited to be out of bed so I didn't think this was out of the ordinary. As the camp progressed, I started getting a weird feeling about the guy. He would start pushing further and further outside the comfort zones of the group. Testing our faith and showing us the intense, God-fearing side of the religion that we should aspire to. Teaching us that through God, we could be absolved of our sins as long as we properly repent and that he would show us how. At one point he was teaching us about mortal sins and he told us that he, as a priest, would not bless his father on his deathbed because his father would not denounce his Lutheranism and be baptized in Catholicism by his son. The next day, our second to last day at camp, toward the end of our final lesson he told us about the rapture and that Jesus was going to come down someday to retrieve our souls for God and that we should be ready for him at any time. He had us pause for meditation to reflect on our sins and it became ghostly quiet in the room. Breaking the silence, he asked us which among us would be ready for Jesus if he entered that room right then to usher them to heaven and that they who were ready should stand. Something dreadful and heavy washed over me and weighted me to my spot on the bench where I was sitting. I looked around to see other kids standing slowly and shifted my sights to my twin brother who was sitting next to me, but getting ready to stand. I grabbed his hand, something very unusual in our relationship, and looked him dead in the eyes, shook my head quickly and mouthed the word no. To my relief he remained seated as we watched all the other boys and girls stand until we were the only two still sitting. He had us all close our eyes and say in our father as he walked over to each individual to bless us on our journey home and dismissed us for the last time on that trip. I never discussed that feeling that washed over me with anyone for quite some time but I'll never forget what it felt like. A deep, dark fear of something I couldn't prove but would not doubt. Two years after I had attended Jesus camp, an article was passed around our community that revealed that the priest, whose name I've since forgotten, had shot himself. It was evident that the police were close to apprehending him for the murder of two of his fellow priests, two years before he was the priest at our camp, because they had found CP on his computer and he could no longer take the pressure. I shudder to think of what might have happened if we had all stood for him that day at camp. Okay, so, my friend and I had were getting really into making music. We ended up building a studio in his garage. Every weekend I'd go over and work on it and make music. One night he starts asking me would you ever sell your soul to get famous? I said hell no. I believe in God and the devil, heaven and hell. His cousin jumps in saying he would. I stay adamant about not ever wanting to do that. It comes with a price and that not something I'm willing to do. As time goes on him and his cousin start doing shows and just start getting a little more recognition than usual. Well my friend isn't the type to get easily afraid or nervous. Then one weekend I head over to his place and he meets me outside. He's standing by the fence just lost in a deep thought. I can't tell Hess trying not to say anything but also know he wants to say something. He eventually takes a deep breath and says do you remember me asking you if you would sell your soul to get rich? I said yeah why? Do you know what Santa Muerte is? It's this saint that will help you get whatever you want, no matter what. Good or bad she'll help you. But you have to give your life to her and always praise her, I asked her for help bro. I started to get angry with him. Explaining it was the devil or a demon hiding as something else. He starts telling me that the SM on the booth didn't mean self-made. He did it to praise her for helping him and his cousin. He said when he asked for help things started happening for them. 
They started meeting new people and getting shows. They even met with the host of a local radio station and were on their way to getting a song played on the radio. But then he tells me one night, they were at a red light and this homeless man came out of nowhere, dancing really weird. He came up to them and asked them what song they were playing. They tell him that it was their song. They said that he said man y'all are gonna go places, Teresa demon around y'all and took off. But while Hess telling me all this he just keeps telling me man I know what God is now bro. Hess love man. Hess just good you know. I kept agreeing with him. We had just had a conversation the week before about how he did and who or what God was. He had never felt him in his life. I asked him what happened and why he was acting like this. He ends up telling me that he was talking to this girl on the phone and she asked him to send her a picture of him. He keeps telling her no but he gives in. He sends her the picture and she ends up asking him if he prays to Santa Muerte. He asked her why and she said that she was behind him in the picture. It was enough to scare him into denouncing her and her help. He tells me he was done with her and wanted to turn to God. I pray with him and tell him let's go roll a blunt and get some drinks. We can go to the golf course and just relax man, it'll be okay. LOL. We go to the golf course after dark, no lights and start talking about different things. Anyway I'm sitting down and he's standing in front of me looking into the golf course. I see him look at something and saw his eyes get big. He turns away and tells me dude let's go. I get up and we start walking. You saw something huh? Yeah, man. I saw something move between the trees. As we get to the fence to leave the golf course, the sprinklers directly in front of us turn on, making an X in front of us. No other sprinklers turned on. Just those, like something didn't want us to leave. It's that bitch man. My friend tells me. So anyway about two weeks later, I go back to his house and me, him and his cousin are in the studio. Me and his co-sween are sitting on the couch and my friend is in the booth. He recording and halfway through the recording, me and his cousin hear the door latch move. We look at each other and at him. He finishes and asked us what we thought. I tell him it was good bro, but we heard the door move. He starts saying that we are messing with him but we both tell him we heard it while he was recording. This is where it got scary. He says it couldn't have moved cause I locked the door. Right when he said this, he had pointed right at the lock and the fucking door swung open. My friend kicked the door and ran out in tears saying it's that fucking bitch man. We just stood there trying to understand what the fuck had just happened. We calm him down and just get our composure back. He later went to rehab for being caught with weed lol it was either that or jail. When he got out 4 months later, he said that this guy asked him if he slept okay. He said that he heard footsteps at night and looked over at my friend. He said there was a hooded figure standing over my friend, who was sleeping on the top bunk, just looking down at him. So this thing had to have been 7 or 8 feet tall. Hess doing well now. Married and has a house. But feels like something is attached to his family.